and um, there'll then be an opportunity for brief questions that can be briefly answered by Ian, um, so questions of clarification in fact, and then about an hour of just discussion among the, the, the audience, and finally Ian will be given a few minutes to respond to anything he wants to respond to from the discussion. The title is Algorithmic Socialism. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Um, <clears throat> so I started coming to uh, CSS meetings a couple of months ago, and they've all been extremely enjoyable and informative, and so I'm glad, genuinely pleased to be able to give something back. So uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, so algorithmic socialism. So really this is an exercise in um, thinking out aloud. And I want to talk about some technology which I think has implications for political strategy. Is this algorithmic socialism? Yes, yes, yes it, it is. is. Yes, it is. So um, we face a difficult historical problem. Uh, the traditional forms of working class organisation, such as reform movements, trade unions, worker co-ops, vanguard parties, communes, transient movements that dissipate very quickly, all these have coexisted with capitalism for well over 150 years or so. So if you do want to abolish capitalist property relations and establish a new kind of society without economic exploitation, then the empirical data is basically in, and these organizational forms will not achieve that goal. So the left needs new ideas for organizing itself. It needs organizational forms that can gain traction with the working class, that transcend national boundaries, and which can organically grow from a small number of people to encompass hundreds of millions of people around the globe. So that's no tall order. So I don't know what that organizational form is. I don't know what that form is, but at the moment I know what it isn't. So I just see this absence. But I do know about some technolo technological improvements and developments that may help solve that historical problem. So obviously my thinking is heavily influenced by my job, which is a computer programmer. So I'm coming at the historical problem from a specific angle. So at best, I hope to provide maybe one piece of the jigsaw puzzle and hopefully spark off some ideas. Okay, so uh, Marx and his theory of historical materialism, it basically states that relatively high frequency technical change drives relatively low frequency institutional change. And Marx expresses this idea with a famous aphorism, which I guess most of you will have heard of. Uh, the handmill gives you society with the feudal lord, the steam mill society with the industrial capitalist. So according to historical materialism, there's a lawful relationship between technology and how we socially organize ourselves. So with this in mind, I want to examine a new ecosystem of technologies that has emerged in the last five to ten years, with some real advances in the last two years, uh, which I think are very interesting and relevant to the historical problem. So let's take uh, smartphones, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks of computers, and the cloud as, all, as a given. And also take it as a given that um, smartphone adoption in the developing world is massively kicking off because these devices are getting cheaper and cheaper. So today I want to examine a new part of this ecosystem, which is the emergence of new kinds of distributed social algorithms. And these new kinds of algorithms hint at new possibilities for organizing ourselves a kind of algorithmic socialism where the working class bootstraps itself into new institutional structures and then self-organizes through democratic mechanisms that control the production of institutional rules where those rules are then executed by incorruptible algorithms or our faithful servants. Now, obviously, that's pretty fuzzy and vague and it couldn't be otherwise at this stage. Hopefully, the end of my talk you'll have an understanding of the material basis for such a statement. And um, to me, this is just a starting point. I think it's not okay to simply throw out vague statements and not precisely specify exactly what you're talking about. And again, this technology gives us the opportunity to, in fact, precisely specify what we mean by socialism. So the starting point is uh, Bitcoin, uh, which most people have now heard about. Uh, when I was first interested in Bitcoin quite some time ago, I just saw it on the internet and thought it was some weird backwater of the internet. I didn't buy any Bitcoin. I really should have. Uh, for those that don't know, Bitcoin is the first successful digital currency which is not backed by any state or government. 
I'm going to briefly describe the underlying technology that powers Bitcoin uh, because it has applications far beyond digital money. So in the handout, which didn't print out particularly well, but there's a picture, there's a photograph, and that is a machine in a warehouse in uh, northern Europe. And uh, there are many like this all over the world. Uh, notice the racks of computers. And the person who took this picture said, the first thing you notice as you approach the warehouse is the noise, and the next thing you notice is the wind. And the noise and the wind come from the large fans that keep the computers cool as they crunch numbers. And the computers get hot because a great deal of computational work is being performed. And that's a picture of a Bitcoin mining factory. And the question is, what does this machine uh, produce? What is this machine doing? So my job in the next five minutes is to uh, answer exactly that. So Bitcoin um, isn't really a coin. And the next page on the handout, you see a picture of a ledger book that might make this a little bit more concrete. Fundamentally, it's a blockchain, which is a data structure very similar to a public ledger or accountancy book. Now, copies of this ledger are stored on about five to 10,000 computers or nodes distributed over the world. And the blockchain is a complete record of all the Bitcoin transactions made between individuals. So in consequence, the quantity of Bitcoins held by any one individual is simply the net result of all the transactions in the ledger. And an individual in the world of Bitcoin is actually an account with a unique uh, digital signature created by public key cryptography. So any of us in this room, for example, can create multiple Bitcoin accounts, uh, join, to the join in the network and start making transactions in Bitcoins, and many people have. Nobody owns or possesses the canonical version of the ledger. It's instead dispersed across the community, and nodes in the network can come and go. Uh, copies can be lost and so on, uh, but the blockchain uh, persists. Okay, so this is the slightly algorithmic technical bit. Um, anyone can write to the ledger by sending messages to all other nodes in the network. The message then spreads across the network until all, all the copies of the ledger have been updated. However, there's a fundamental problem with this scheme, uh, which is called the problem of double spending. So let's imagine I want to buy some pizza with Bitcoin. So I create a transaction by broadcasting the message, I pay 10 coins to A. And A is a person who's going to send me pizza in return. The blockchain ledger gets updated with this transaction. So I now have 10 fewer Bitcoins and A has 10 more. But then I sneakily create a new identity called B, which is a simple matter of creating a new account with a unique digital signature. And then I broadcast another message. I pay, I pay 10 coins to B. So I've spent my 10 Bitcoins twice. Me as a real person behind both those identities now has 10 Bitcoins and I also have some pizza. So there's a contradiction in the network. Now, of course, with commodity money such as gold, there's an actual substance that gets exchanged between people. So it's much more difficult to cheat that system and double spend. Or with state-backed money, we put our trust in a central authority who in a sense maintains a single copy of that ledger book. But the aim of Bitcoin is to be a digital currency that is free of centralized authorities. So Bitcoin needs to solve this double spending problem. And the key uh, technological innovation of Bitcoin is its solution to the double spending problem. And the key idea is that writing true entries in the ledger book is more profitable than writing false entries. So there's a systemic incentive for the Bitcoin community to converge to a record of truthful transactions that can serve value in exchange. And how Bitcoin achieves this is pretty subtle and, and complex. So I'll try to give you a flavor of the algorithm without going into too much detail. But I do think it's important to understand, at least in broad terms, how this system works. So as I mentioned, all nodes in the network receive transaction messages and update their copy of the ledger. And the Bitcoin system presents all the nodes, and these nodes could be you, with the following incentive. If you are the first to solve a particular kind of mathematical problem, 
by performing computational work, then you get a reward. And the reward is that you get to add an entry to the ledger book that assigns yourself some bitcoins out of thin air. And since you are the winner of the competition, you get to write the next page of the ledger book that contains your reward. So if you can imagine, as the winner, you get to package up all the transactions and messages you've received since the last competition was run and create a new block in the blockchain. You then broadcast this block to all the other nodes in the network who verify the correctness of your answer to the mathematical problem. If your block passes the checks, the other miners stop what they're doing, accept your block, and add it to their local copy of the blockchain. And therefore, a new page in the ledger book has been written. So the Bitcoin miners are all in competition with each other, all racing to create the next page in the ledger and grab that Bitcoin reward. In a nutshell, that's the mechanism. But why does it solve the double spending problem? Well, first, in order to cheat, you need to do some non-trivial work. And that's a cost to you. So you can't simply spam the system with false transactions. There's a cost to cheating. And second, in order to cheat, you need to win a competition so that your false transaction gets written down in the ledger book. However, winning this competition is essentially a lottery. The only method you have of gaming the lottery is if you apply more CPU power than the combined power of all the other nodes in the system. And third, and this is the clincher, if you really had all this CPU power, then you would need to prefer to undermine the whole system and the basis of your own wealth rather than simply reap the Bitcoin reward of being honest and writing a truthful next page in the ledger book. So as a consequence of all these mechanisms and incentives, cheating is unlikely with high probability. It's not certain, it's just unlikely with high probability. So a number of ideas that come together in Bitcoin. The blockchain algorithm is common property. The source code is open. Anyone can run it, start their own node, join the system. Anyone can alter the source code and create their own variants of it. Bitcoin simulates commodity money, such as gold, in a computational setting. So to create money, you've got to expend some labor and metaphorically dig it out of the ground. Anyone in principle can start digging and issuing their own coin. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, the system is designed to incentivize the community to reach a consensus on a public record of information, which no single party owns or controls. So what we have then is a distributed algorithm for reaching consensus without the need to place trust in a central authority. So returning to the original question, uh, what is that machine doing? What, what is that machine producing? Essentially, it's a machine that makes a profit by producing a truthful record of social interactions. So that's, that's Bitcoin and the underlying blockchain technology. I hope you have some idea what the what problem it solves and how it solves it. Now, I want to put Bitcoin aside uh, for one moment. I want to now focus on some new developments of the last two years which significantly increased the power of the blockchain algorithm. So <clears throat> we've seen that the blockchain algorithm can enforce a specific kind of social rule, which is conservation of value in exchange, without the need for a central authority. Now, someone then noticed uh, two things. First, we can store any kind of information on the blockchain, not just the kind of entries you'll find in a ledger book. And second, the Bitcoin rule, which conserves value in exchange, is, is really just a specific kind of social rule, a kind of very simple algorithm. So why not generalize? And the key idea first is to add a Turing complete programming language to the blockchain. And second, let's store arbitrary algorithms written in that language on the blockchain. So this idea transforms the ledger book into a public book of algorithms. And instead of simple messages such as A pays 10 Bitcoins to B, which transfers value between accounts, we can instead allow arbitrary messages which transfers any kind of information between accounts. And this idea transforms the processing of Bitcoin transactions into the execution of arbitrary programs which can then call each other. And finally, let's have algorithms have their own accounts, 
and their own digital signatures. And then they send and receive messages to themselves and other people. So what we have now is essentially a large decentralized computer that contains millions of algorithmic objects which store their own data, execute code, and talk to each other. In the entire state of this computational system, the algorithms and the data is distributed across any number of machines around the globe. And anyone can add algorithms to the book. But the really important property is that the integrity of this computational system is maintained without the need for trusting in the central authority. We can be sure with very high probability that any particular algorithm will execute according to its specification and messages will be delivered without any interference. So before the blockchain algorithm could only enforce a simple kind of exchange rule, but now the blockchain algorithm can enforce any kind of social rule that can be encoded as a computer program. So that's rather abstract. So let me provide some examples of what people can now build. So let's say you want to start a club that collects membership fees. And let's also say, just for the purposes of illustration, that the club's financial resources can only be spent if every member agrees upon the proposed transaction. Now, setting up this kind of joint account and managing the democratic process is, of course, doable today, but it's not easy to set up. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved and there's a lot of uh, trust involved. The club members have to put their trust in the high street bank, the club accountant, and the subset of members who organize the ballot and count the votes. And we also know from historical experience that, that trust is often misplaced. However, once we allow arbitrary algorithms on the blockchain, then sitting up, setting up this kind of club becomes uh, trivial. And I've seen implementations of this kind of functionality in about 100 lines of code. So just in case um, you didn't quite catch that, that means any reasonable coder can prototype a simple deposit account with democratic control in a couple of days and then throw it onto the blockchain for anyone to use. So the production of institutional rules and structures has suddenly got a lot cheaper and a lot easier. But also, these are different kinds of social institutions. The institution with the rules that are enforced by incorruptible algorithms. So let me briefly mention some other kinds of applications which uh, people have been actively working on today uh, to give you an idea of the range of possibilities. Some might cause you to shrug your shoulders, some might alarm you, uh, others hopefully will get you interested and excited and thinking about possibilities. So of course first, uh, money and various kinds of banking services such as deposits and savings accounts, they can be transferred to the blockchain. That in itself is significant. Uh, more experimental kinds of money considered in the socialist tradition could also be implemented. All the possible variants of voting schemes can be implemented and enforced, and that also is hugely significant. Property claims, say the ownership of cars or land, housing, stocks, pretty much anything, in principle can be decentralized. So instead of paper titles managed by a central bureaucracy, ownership claims can be stored on the blockchain. We can go further and you can place computation in objects. So physical property, let's say a car, can become a node in the blockchain system. So the car then knows its owner and only activates if it receives a message with the owner's digital signature. And people call this smart property. Now, obviously, smart property can also be used to manage common property, including enforcing rules for sharing or swapping or transferring ownership based on votes. Another application is smart contracts. So algorithms automatically execute the terms of legal contracts. So let's say, for example, a betting contract. A and B bet on the outcome of the FA Cup. A and B send their bitcoins to a betting algorithm on the blockchain, who then holds their money in an escrow account on the blockchain. When the game is over, the smart contract verifies the outcome and pays out the winning. Now, this idea can, of course, be further generalized. Smart contracts can include governance schemes, such as assigning an individual or group to control membership lists or digital assets or bank accounts, whether that control can be revoked and under what circumstances, or whether it's time-limited or randomly allocated. If it can be encoded as a computer program, 
it can be enforced as an institutional rule. Institutional rules of a traditional company or non-profit or worker co-op or political party, some of those rules can be replicated now on the blockchain. Uh, perhaps the most general and abstract idea is that of a decentralized autonomous organization. This is an algorithmic entity that maintains a membership who can vote to spend the entity's funds, but also vote to modify its code. So members can collectively decide on how to modify the algorithms that encode the institutional rules of the organization. And the point of this example is that the blockchain plus algorithms enables new kinds of institutional structures which will be much more fluid and dynamic than the ones we're used to today. So I want to stress these ideas are not science fiction. They're currently being worked on today. Uh, libertarian venture capital in Silicon Valley is pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into this ecosystem. They're very excited about it. Perhaps the most interesting project currently in development is an open source project called uh, Ethereum. Its creators describe it as a community-driven project aimed to decentralize the internet and return it to its democratic roots. And I've included a link to the Ethereum webpage on the, uh, the handout. Ethereum does exactly what I've just described. It adds a Turing complete programming language to the blockchain algorithm. And last year, Ethereum, in less than a month, raised about $21 million from public crowdfunding. And it's currently going through public testing. So I could write an algorithm on the Ethereum blockchain today. And uh, I think I'd like to. Now, of course, this technology and some of the progressive ideas that go with it will soon be disciplined to satisfy the reproduction conditions of capitalist property relations. Nonetheless, something new uh, now exists. So <clears throat> trying to summarize all this complexity and this explosion of ideas, all these new possibilities, the basically the blockchain algorithm, once we generalize it, becomes something like an operating system for society. It enforces social rules without the need for a central authority. Instead, we put our trust in a decentralized system run by incorruptible algorithms who become our servants who faithfully execute the rules that we create. So I think it's time for me to wrap up uh, and return to the historical problem, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning, of finding new forms of uh, working class organization which aim to transcend uh, capitalist property relations. So the kind of uh, blockchain-like technology I've described create new possibilities, I believe, for socialist strategy and organization. And I think the major points to consider are these. First, setting up and creating the kinds of institutions necessary to run an entire socialist state just got easier and cheaper. The barrier to performing experiments and trying things out is much lower than it was before. We have, in a sense, do-it-yourself social institutions. Second, the institutional rules can now be executed by infallible and incorruptible algorithms. So it'll be much harder to corrupt these institutions and break the rules. They will be super trustworthy institutions. And third, these institutions are immediately global. In principle, anyone with access to a computer and the internet can immediately join in and begin to participate in these structures. So these are the new possibilities. These are the material foundations for the possibility of some kind of algorithmic socialism. And the question is, can we use these new technologies to solve the historical problem? So I'll leave you all with that, that question. OK, uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, it's fantastic to get all the thoughts on something that I've been thinking about for quite some time, many years actually, and this is the first occasion where I've really just um, taken the first step to say what I've been thinking. So all your reactions are brand new to me and, and interesting at the very least for that reason. Um, I'll try and briefly respond to some of the comments. And I'm sorry if I've forgotten anything. A lot was said. Um, and I don't normally do this kind of thing, so my ability to summarize and uh, <laughs> bring it all together may not be so great, so let me try. So the notion of um, incorruptible, faithful servants. See, I, I chose that language on purpose because I was kind of challenging everyone to um, start to think of uh, these algorithms as 
There's nothing to be frightened of. There's actually something to um, welcome. In the same way, we welcome all kinds of machines in our life, like the vacuum cleaner or the dishwasher. I don't really, really understand fundamentally how a dishwasher works. I don't understand how my car works, actually. Uh, maybe I do a little bit now. It's taken many years. But I, I'm happy to use these things and rely on them. And um, there's a certain amount of trust that you can't, obviously, I'm not, I'm not arguing that you should get rid of trust out of human society. You've got to rely on experts. And if it's something useful to you, then you, you will use it. And I think the same can potentially apply, well, in fact, does apply to uh, social institutions. Um, I don't think these kinds of algorithmic social institutions would be necessarily very different um, in that sense. These are social machines. People will get annoyed with them. They'll have problems. They'll have bugs. They'll definitely have bugs. Um, they'll, they'll go wrong if you're not, you know, have to fix that. No, well, they're just machines. Can be used well. They can be used badly. Um, cause pleasure. Cause pain. Um, on the issue of um, the dangers of, of big authorities like the states uh, smashing the system. Yes, of course, um, they may w well want to, and in fact, they will have the power to do so. And um, these powerful players can, in fact, break things. What a great problem to have if, in fact, you were, had a social institution that the state had some interest in and would like to smash. <laughs> that, that's a good problem to have. We don't have that problem at the moment. We don't. The problem is we don't have any social institutions that anyone wants to turn up to. And um, so I'd be happy to have that problem. And when it came to that, obviously, if it was any kind of mass movement, there'd be a group of people in the Division of Labour who would be building their own platform, didn't rely on the existing system, and you have an insurance policy, of course. Uh, but that's just simply... Not a problem at the moment. Um, um, does this matter, this one? Um, no, I'll, I will not bother with that one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, have a, <laughs> no, I have a transparent mind. <laughs> Uh, right, so some, somebody asked, and it's a very good question, which was, um, well, it's related to a lot of people. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't solve the problem how we can get from here to there. It doesn't at all. Uh, this is a technology. It's, uh, it's uh, new causal powers that are available to us. But it doesn't solve that problem. And the, the historical problem of what kind of working class organizations could get us there I said nothing uh, today about that um, for, for two reasons. One, I'm not sure. I have some ideas, but they're very unfinished. Second, if I did start talking about those, the conversation would probably turn to the merit or lack of them of those ideas. And that is not the point. The point is that um, everyone should think about how we could use the technology to get from here to there. And... Um, that's a conversation for another, another day, perhaps. Um, I think the fact that it's cheap to use social institutions, that you can experiment with them, and they have this property of being uh, transparent and causally enforced, in a way, by machines, is something uh, qualitatively new in the landscape. Um, so other machines, like I've met people, I interviewed a roboticist once for a job, and I asked them, why were they interested in, in, in robots? And they said, because this is the way uh, we will be able to uh, reduce the, the working week. And uh, they were a very intelligent person, but you know, not, not that intelligent. And, uh, <laughs> and the, reason, the reason that no machines will reduce the working day is because the surplus labor manifests as profit. Profit is reinvested into accumulation, employs more people and the working week is not reduced. So labor-saving technical devices under capitalism do not lead to reduction in the working day. But this, uh, so this, this uh, set of technologies will uh, lower labor costs in, in, uh, in bureaucracies uh, and um, make them more productive in, in a capitalist sense. Um, okay, 
Uh, obviously, they won't reduce the work intake. But the, the point is, how do we get here from here to there? And I, th I think you said, is that uh, Adam? Yeah, yeah Adam, uh, Adam said um, that under capitalism, this technology could be used in a certain way and probably just reproduced uh, the, the capitalist <coughs> system. Under socialism, it could be reduced, uh, used in a different way. But I think I'm trying to suggest uh, something different. I'm trying to suggest that this is a technology that would allow us to begin to build socialism now and, and partially enter uh, that institutional structure, partially exit the capitalist system now and partially enter uh, a new social institution now. Um, so it, it's not about a stage where there's... there's there's a current system, then there's a post-capitalist system, and then we start using technology in the way it should be. No, this is a means, I think, to uh, begin building a socialist society uh, now. Um, and I think that is essentially the question I pose at the end of my talk, which is how can we use this technology to build uh, uh, institutions that organize the working class? And uh, transcend capitalist populations and, and abolish economic exploitation. And um, that's uh, what I think the opportunity this technology provides. And um, that's where my thinking turns to. And I think there's other things I could talk about, but I think I'll stop there. Thanks again. It's been a very exciting, interesting uh, um, meeting. Um, so just to let you know, next week's meeting.